Um, now, Mr. Levertem, what is it that you actually did with the phone to examine it? Well, the first thing I did was uh, I had written out a test plan and uh, I, I knew what to expect out of a uh, Blackberry Pearl. First thing I did was I opened up the phone like I did this one and there's a, a serial number in there, a worldwide serial. It, it's worldwide unique. Only one phone has that serial number. And um, I checked that the serial number was consistent with what I <coughs> expected for a Blackberry Pearl. The first couple of number, first couple of digits tells you what type of phone it is. So that matched up, so I knew it was the right model. Uh, then I tried to power on the phone. I, I opened the phone, saw that there was a SIM card in it because it wouldn't work without the SIM card. So I powered up the phone. It was dead. So uh, I spent about 15 minutes charging it up. Once it's charged up, I turned on the phone, and it uh, immediately said, reject SIM. Uh, and what, what does it mean when it says reject SIM? OK. Um, if it says invalid SIM, if, if the phone, if you put it, there are two things. If you put a, a card, uh, these phone companies like to try to keep you with them. So like AT&T won't let you put this SIM card in a T-Mobile phone. It will say invalid SIM. Okay, but if it says rejected SIM, that means that SIM is destroyed. It can't be used. You have to buy another one. Okay. Um, what was displayed on the screen? when you powered up the phone? Okay, uh, what immediately comes up is the last date that phone was powered up, all right? And that date was September 29th, 2008 at 10.22 a.m. And um, the reason that comes up is when you turn on your phone and you first connect up with that cell tower, it gets a bunch of information. One of the pieces of information it gets is what's the current date and time? What's the current what? What's the current date and time? Date and time. I'm sorry. Yeah. sorry. And how does it get the information of what the date and time is? From the cell tower. The cell tower broadcasts that constantly along with, uh, you know, its ID, a lot of technical stuff that I won't get into. Okay. Yeah. What happens uh, when it is unable to connect with the cell tower? It, it just uh, sh it shows no service. Okay. And what was it that it displayed on, the, on Nancy's cell? Uh, it, it would not work with a SIM card in it because the SIM card was destroyed. Okay. Did you attempt to navigate the phone at that point? Yes, I took the SIM card out. Okay, now when you when you got a phone like this with no SIM card in it, one thing you can do is call 911. You'd always go, this is like a shell. All right, so um, I wanted to see if the phone was broken. So uh, I dialed 911, I immediately got an operator, I knew the phone was working, okay? Then what, uh, with, the, with the SIM card out, I started navigating through all the menus. Now, uh, like I said, this is like uh, something you get in your camera phone. It's a real small memory card. All right, so when you take pictures, SIM card is a small memory. And when you take pictures, they get stored on the phone. So I was gonna go through the phone, look for pictures, files, uh, you know, on that uh, BlackBerry, you get a browser, and I wanted to look at the browser, look at the history. Uh, you know, a lot of times you can go back. On a phone like that, probably hold 50, 50 previous web pages that the phone had been to. Uh, yeah, manual. I push your left hand. I'm showing you what's going to mark the state's exhibit 34 previously identified as, as Cooper's cell phone. Uh, do you recognize that as the cell phone that you had examined? Yes, I do. Okay. And I'd ask if you could put away the pieces of the other cell phones. We don't 
accuse them. And if, as you are discussing, uh, that would help illustrate your testimony, if you could use that one instead. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, so. And so you were explaining okay. uh, what it was you did to get information off the phone. First thing I did was open it up. Do you see there's a label in there that tells you what the serial number is? Now, so this is not a, yeah. Specifically with respect to that type of cell phone, what kind of information can be stored on that? Okay. This is like a mini computer, all right? This is, uh, the SIM card's going to hold your phone number. It's going to hold uh, all the technical, technical garbage that the phone needs uh, to operate and to say that you got a legal su subscription. And it'll say what features you have. You can put your phone list on this as well. But it's not very much of a memory. So most of the memory is going to be inside the phone. So if if I took one of your, uh, if one of you had a, a similar BlackBerry and I took that phone from you and you took out the SIM card, I could still turn this on, which uh, after powering this phone up, I was able to turn it on. I could call 911, which I was able to do, so I knew the phone was operating. Um, I could also start scrolling through the men memory and look for pictures. Then I went to text messages. And I looked at sent text messages. No sent text messages whatsoever. I went to uh, received and draft, empty. Nothing in there. Uh, OK, so I expected to go in there and be able to tell kind of a timeline of when Nancy was using this phone, when she stopped using the phone, when she started using it again. Because one of the biggest things I got to do when I do a cell phone examination, kind of build a timetable. Okay, uh, the other thing that'll be in there would be phone list. If you don't store your phone list on your SIM card, it defaults to slave on the phone. I didn't find any phone list. That, uh, I, I examined this with a something called a uh, card reader, it, all right, and I got software that reads specifically SIM cards. And when I did that, I found that this card was totally wiped out, which is odd, which was very unusual to me. Okay, it didn't have phone list here, it didn't have phone list here, it didn't have our phone number on it, it didn't even say that it was an AT&T phone because normally the SIM card would show this is AT&T, uh, this is this software version, it's, uh, you know, it, the subscriber's uh, name, the preferred language, because uh, that's always on the... Do you recognize this letter? Yes. Yes, I recognize this letter. Did you receive that letter along with the cell phone? Yes, I did. That's where I got this serial number for the phone. Okay, and who was it? Do you recall who it was that gave you the phone and the letter? It was a detective, uh, Young, from the Cary Police Department. And? Jim Young. What is it that he describes in the course of that letter? Well, in this letter, he's goes through this explanation that he accidentally erased his phone using, if I can quote him, uh, I completed steps successfully to unlock the cellular phone. These steps failed to successfully unlock the cell phone, and in fact, it wiped out any and all information contained on the cellular phone. Your Honor, this time I move. And this time I'm going to show you Yes, I do. And was that letter something that you considered in preparing your report? Yes, it is. And how did this letter impact uh, the preparation of your report, Jackson? 
I could. Uh, I'm sorry. Answer the question. You can answer. Uh, I, I considered this letter when I prepared my report. Okay. And in what way did you consider it? How did this influence your decision? Well, when I, uh, when I uh, do a, a cell phone study, one thing I request is that all the data be preserved. Um, and when I received this letter dated July 30, 2008, I knew that the data I was going to be looking at had already been preserved okay. as of July 30th. So there was no worries that I wouldn't have uh, the evidence I need to work with. Yeah. And now the letter that you're holding is to the police. What is, your, what is the purpose of sending a letter to preserve data to a police department? Well, um, any police department um, that that has a cell phone should be notified that you know they need to not mess with the data. The first thing the police have to do is turn off that cell phone and preserve to preserve the data. So, what is the proper way for uh, law enforcement to actually perform an exam on cell phones? Well, first of all, you have, there's, there's always a four-step protocol for forensics. Number one, and this is what I... Okay, and this is what I teach. And uh, what I teach is the first thing you do is you turn off any equipment you're going to pick up at a crime scene. After you do that second, if you need to do that second step, then the forensic expert's got to write out an explanation of what he did then uh, that would give you a clue. Third thing you do is once the emergency situation is over, you bring it to a forensic person. What they do is they do something called non-destructive testing. Okay, non-destructive testing means that while that phone's in either a room that's got absolutely no cell phone service, no GPS service, uh, you hook up or inside a Faraday bag or inside a Faraday room, you turn on that phone and you copy it. You make a perfect copy of that phone. That's the third protocol. You never work with the device itself. You always work with a copy so that you don't change any evidence. And this way, uh, when the police uh, are examining the phone, they know they haven't modified it. So now they got this copy, and then the fourth protocol is you put that, you seal that back up, put that phone away, write a report of what you did. I opened up the phone in a room that got no cell phone service, pretty much any house I've lived in, and I plugged it in, and I made a perfect copy of that phone. Then I closed it back up, sealed it, put it away, and then the fourth protocol is I did a forensic analysis of what I found on that phone.